whole club, but as head of Disney, you know, you can, you can go just about anywhere. Unfortunately, when I go to these places, the first question they typically ask me is, okay, when are we getting a Disney ride? And that hasn't come up yet, but I don't know if we can, can we put the picture up? We're announcing things here in Butte. We have a picture of, um, yeah. that's what we have in store. That's what we've just announced. <laughs> I want to say don't get your hopes up, but I... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you have 100 million visitors a year to your Disney World, Disneyland. We have about 10 million visitors uh, to Montana. We believe that the more people see the majesty of the big sky in person, or for those around the world who can't get to Montana, we think that if we can put the big sky on the big screen, we can naturally sell the attributes of Montana. Um, as you know, I stopped down to visit with you at your office, and uh, it almost ended badly. Uh, he was uh, test driving, actually, for a period of time, a, a hydrogen car. And so he said, Gov, come on, I, I just got this thing, and uh, would you like to take it for a drive? Now, for some of you who know around Montana, a lot of times uh, I'm driven by uh, a cop, and, and uh, like the rest of you in Montana, none of us are good drivers when you get to California. I mean, it's dangerous for a Montanan to be driving in Los Angeles. And so I got behind the wheel in downtown Los Angeles in a hydrogen car and drove it around a little bit. And, uh, of course, if somebody would have rear-ended me, Los Angeles would have looked like the Berkeley pit. But we made it through that one. <laughs> I, I must admit, I did have some second thoughts about that because <laughs> I was told when I got the car that it could do a fair amount of damage to neighborhoods if I didn't if I didn't treat it well, and I had no idea whether you're a good driver or not. But remember, I got in with you, which was particularly brave. I'm good with a pickup in four-wheel drive on a dirt road. I'm not so sure that I, I'm, I'm a very good driver in Los Angeles. My wife wouldn't let me take the car into our driveway. But the best thing about driving that car in Los Angeles was no one would tailgate me <laughs> because there were signs on it that it was a hydrogen car. <laughs> it's amazing. I could have had red lights on it. That day I asked you a question, and I'll ask you that question again. Uh, how can we in Montana attract Disney to make more movies, more films in Montana? Well, uh, we, the, the great news about the movie industry and the television industry is pretty mobile, meaning we could, we could make things just about anywhere as long as you can attract good people to help you make it, and that's certainly the case in the state. States across the country, numerous states, not every state, have pretty attractive uh, tax subsidies to make it more economically viable for not just the Walt Disney Company, but for film and television companies to film in their states. And uh, the discounts are pretty aggressive in some states, as high as 30, possibly even 40 percent in terms of tax breaks. And while on the surface that sounds like that's a, um, a gift for a public corporation, or particularly a successful one, uh, it's been proven, and this has been written about in uh, New York Times, The Economist, but there have been some pretty good studies done that when a state provides a tax subsidy for filming, they create jobs and there is a, a positive balance of sorts. I think the last statistic I saw is that in some states, particularly Louisiana, they've been pretty aggressive. For every dollar that they basically spent in a tax subsidy, they brought in two dollars in other revenue, job creation, other taxes, uh, other forms of consumption in the state. So one way to uh, attract not just Disney but uh, other companies in our space is to make sure that you're competitive and get these tax subsidies. Uh, and as I said, there are a lot of states that do this. Michigan, Louisiana are two that come to mind. We didn't uh, do any filming in Louisiana until probably about 10 years ago. And their state created a program and made it really viable and attractive for us, and we've done a lot of filming there. We've done some shooting in Montana, but not much. It's been a while since we've done a major motion picture. I saw a statistic recently that said that if a major motion picture shoots in a location, uh, it generates about $250,000 a day in revenue, which is, it must mean that you're making motion pictures that are too expensive, by the way, but that's another <laughs> story. So that's one, that's one thing that can be done. Um, more and more, we are uh, creating things, not just for movies and television, but for our other businesses outside the state. Here's a quick clip of something called Club Penguin in that uh, video. That's a company that we bought that's an internet, uh, basically it's an online virtual world for kids. 
that's from Kalana, British Columbia. And when we bought it, that was the first thing we decided to do was keep it there because people liked living there, it's good quality of living, and it made perfect sense for us technologically and economically to keep the business there. And there's no reason why similar businesses can't be based in places around this state. Certainly, from, from our perspective, it, it's mostly about um, where do people want to live and work as opposed to where we want to house and live and work. Well, we have the finest place in the world to start and grow a small business, uh, according to the American Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it is the best place in the world to raise a family, and it's still the best place in the world to build a community. When we, when we talked about uh, bringing the film industry to Montana uh, six years ago, and we passed the Big Sky on the Big Screen Act that gave uh, incentives, uh, I, I was driven because my favorite movie all time, I don't know if you made this one, was Legends of the Fall. And that is a great movie about a Montana ranch family filmed in Alberta. And, <laughs> and I wanted to do something about that. Alberta was attracting these films. They that were claiming not, we they were Montana. It was not our fault. Claiming it was Montana. And so at that time, the Canadian dollar was about 68 cents. Now it's about 95 cents, so there's a 30% change. They were offering some 15 or 20% in film incentives, but they also have somewhere between a 10 and 12% uh, value added tax, a sales tax, when you add national and, and uh, provincial. And so we don't have sales tax. The dollar differentials change by 30%. We're offering 10 to 15%, depending on what you're spending. And um, not a lot of companies have come to film here. Not big films, not enough, not as many as we anticipated. I gotta believe there's something else going on here because you're still in California as a headquarters and there isn't a worse place in the world to do business right now. Your taxes are high, your regulations are great, <laughs> the infrastructure is terrible, you can't get from point A to point B and yet you haven't moved to Billings <laughs> or haven't moved to Bozeman. I mean, we, we think that you said it, you choose where you want to do the business, and this competition between the governors is a race to the bottom. I'm, I'm more than willing to be competitive, and we are in almost every way that we're measuring ourselves, but when we do the incentives, and still, still it goes someplace else, it frustrates us. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, California, and I, I'm, I won't say a bad word about the state that I live and vote in, I'm raising my kids in right now, uh, but California has suffered from uh, a real uh, drain or blight in terms of film production. The subsidies that I talked about from other states have actually uh, driven a lot of motion picture uh, filming and television filming outside of California, which is a huge issue. We're, our, as a corporation, we're housed in California. And we do a lot of business there. We own one theme park in uh, Anaheim. We also are, uh, ESPN's based in Bristol, Connecticut. Uh, ABC's got major headquarters in California and New York. We have over 55,000 employees in Orlando, largest single site employee from a public perspective, a private rather, not public, in the country, in Orlando at uh, Walt Disney World. So we've spread the wealth of the company, so to speak, and uh, given the fact that we believe that we're still in growth mode and have an opportunity to do business in, in many different places, both inside and outside the country, I wouldn't rule out Disney doing some, some more business in, in Montana. By the way, we do have ten of Montana. <laughs> <coughs> no, you don't. <laughs> and you, you might own some. You might owe some copyright on this one. My grandmother immigrated from Ireland and homesteaded in Liberty County, and her name was Hannah Montana. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, you are the best at what you do. I'm saying it. You're no. not. You are the best at what you do. You run the most important, largest entertainment company in the history of the world. You're good at it. If you could have selected another path, if you could be anything, if you could have any other job in the world, what would it be and why? Well, first of all, I feel unbelievably uh, blessed to have a job like this. I did not grow up dreaming I was going to run the Walt Disney Company like you. Uh, I sat around a black and white TV in the living room of my, my uh, parents' house and watched the Mickey Mouse Club on television and, or watched Walt Disney building Disneyland. And it's not like someone said to me, son, one day you're going to be that or that I even thought that was possible.
possible. So I set out rather humbly as a weatherman, and not a good one, as you mentioned, I, I was a weatherman, um, and just stayed at it, meaning I started with ABC in 1974, so it's been almost 37 years since 2011, and uh, as a production assistant on soap operas and game shows, after I was a weatherman, and I got a lot of good breaks and worked hard and like to think that I treated people well along the way. And well, you filibustered now. What is that other position? So, so <laughs> I've, never, I've never really had, the interesting thing is I haven't had that much time to think of the what ifs or if I'm not doing this, although I'm now doing this job for five years and um, that too is somewhat of a miracle to me. And um, you do start thinking at some point, okay, what are you gonna do next? I'm not gonna run for governor of Montana, so. You're, you're term limited anyway, so you don't have to worry about that. I don't know. I like to. I, if I didn't do this, I, you know, I always dreamed of being a newscaster. I'm going to be a little too old to do that by the, you know, by the time I leave this job. Most of what I think about is giving back in some form, uh, in some in some public way. I don't know how you know I will do that. It's a little premature to be thinking about that. Um, I always like to cook, but I'm not going to open a restaurant. I don't, there really isn't a good answer to your question. I, I showed up at work every day, happy to be there, and certainly, I know it sounds very simple, but appreciative of the opportunities that have been given to me. I've worked with some extraordinary people, a guy named Rune Arledge, who was head of ABC Sports, I worked for for 10 years, and worked on a program called Wide World of Sports in its day. That got me around the world, following the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Who was um, that guy that wrecked? on the skis. You remember that? We'd watch that and there was a guy that went tumble sure. ski kettle over uh, top hat. That was the agony of defeat. That was it. <laughs> yes. That was a then Yugoslavia. Now Yugoslavia has since split up into multiple parts named Venko Bogatai. And uh, he was a ski jumper that fell off the end of the ski jump. I don't even remember where that, that event took place and crashed rather um, spectacularly into uh, people and things, <laughs> was fine, he was not injured, and we put him on Wide World of Sports at the beginning and the end of every telecast every weekend for about 30 years. <laughs> 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 and the funny, I know we're here to maybe talk business, but I have one anecdote about him. In 1981, Wide World of Sports was then 20 years old, and we celebrated with a big black tie dinner at the Waldorf Astoria in Manhattan. It was then a rather significant program, and American television, and we invited athletes who participated in the wide world of sports over the years to come to this big dinner, and I had to find Venko at a, working in a factory in Yugoslavia, a manufactured anchor chain, and we brought him to the United States. He had no clue just how famous or infamous he was, <laughs> and that night, two people got standing ovations, Muhammad Ali and Venko Bogatai. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget it. <laughs> well, there's hope for there's hope for all of us in our uh, in our wrecks. It was a great moment. It was a great moment. Well, Bob, as as you know, I spend uh, a fair bit of my time on the road, going to corporate headquarters like yours, trying to get people to invest in Montana, and uh, I think you could just assume that I'll be back one more time. Yeah. I'll try it again and. Disney World Montana. How's that sound? Think of that. Bob Iger, CEO and President of Disney. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.